Afternoon, everyone. Wait a minute. There we are. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Federation Hall here at the BCA. If you haven't met me, I'm David Sequeira, and I'm the director of the Fiona and Sydney Maya Gallery, and also the person that puts the Art Forum program together. And before I introduce our guest speaker, I invite you to join me in grounding yourself in a sense of, uh, sense of place. Um, and, and really, you know, ground yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the VCA was thought of, that the Bunurang and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, for generations, they practiced song and dance here, shared stories, practiced healing, um, they made paintings, they made sculptures, raised families, and those traditions and rituals continue today. And it really is with great honor and joy that we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Now to introduce our guest speaker, Alicia Frankovic. And it's always great to introduce a staff member um, because as you know, Alicia is no stranger to the VCA and she teaches in the honors program. Um, but this is your this is the first time you're doing a public talk yes. for the VCA. Yeah, so um, Alicia was born in Aotearoa in New Zealand and is currently based here in Nam. Alicia is an artist working across sculpture, performance, video, photography, and the format of the exhibition itself. Her work engages living, human, and non-human entities to reveal the limits of how we understand notions of nature. She has lived and worked in Berlin and Canberra, and Alicia has a BVA in sculpture from AUT Auckland, and an MFA from Monash University, and she's the current recipient of an Australian government research training program. Um, she's doing her PhD at Monash. At, sorry? Oh, you finished it. So <laughs> um, yeah, um, oh, hold on, wait. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alicia's work's been shown in major surveys of contemporary art all over the world, and she's undertaken residencies at the ISCP in New York, Air Antwerpen in, um, in Belgium, Kunstlerhaus Bethlehem in Berlin, Gertrude Contemporary, and her work, her recent work, Alicia Frankovich, Rich in World, Poor in World, was one of the highlights of the 2023 Melbourne Now Performance Program. Wherever you are, in Zoom land, in Federation Hall, please make Alicia Frankovich very, very welcome. Um, thank you, David. Um, and I'd just like to extend the acknowledgement of country um, uh, to um, acknowledge the Boon and Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and um, to pay respects to um, their elders past and present and um, to acknowledge any other First Nations people joining us today. Uh, it's really great to be speaking, as David mentioned, um, in a space where I'm also teaching. It's really nice to see so many students and staff here. Um, I have about a 20 year career. I uh, graduated from my BBA in 2002. And um, as mentioned, uh, have worked overseas, lived in Germany for around 10 years and uh, back here in Nam, which is really great. Um, I'm kind of addressing my work um, in an essayistic way. It's not really chronological. Um, I thought I'd start with this work called AQI 2020. Uh, I spent a couple of years living in Canberra um, and that's how this work came about, um, Air Quality Index 2020. Um, and it's this uh, kind of remediation or sculptural performance situation, um, born, which was born out of the Black Summer bushfires of 2019 to 2020, uh, where smoke from the Aurora Valley and Karawan fires kind of engulfed um, the New South Wales coast, and in particular Canberra, where I was living. And, one day there was an AQI reading of 7,700. Um, the average reading today would be around 26. So um, yeah, if we kind of cast our thoughts back to that scenario, um, I was kind of making a work out of remediations from stories of um, 
people like news news articles and um, like uh, friends who were like in the region um, communicating with me directly um, from the scenario. Um, this was an image that was um, blog, uh, posted on Twitter by someone called Alistair Pryor. And the photo was by Kirsty Blake of a number of people who had evacuated um, uh, in, on the New South Wales coast. And it was um, New Year's Eve and they had just their bare bones kind of belongings and this like uh, red haze, um, the kind of emergency evacuation boat, the, the camp chairs. Um, and uh, so I kind of took these various um, scenarios and uh, built a choreography um, within this plexiglass box. Uh, and uh, that was um, exhibited, as you can see, uh, sort of four hours daily uh, for a couple of months um, at the Auckland Art Gallery and later acquired by, uh, within the collection of Auckland Art Gallery Toyo Tamaki. So that was, um, my first performance work that had been acquired. Um, so all of the um, movements within it, the sound piece, the, the smoke haze box inside the booth um, were, um, have gone into that collection. Uh, music piece by I Igor Klavinsky. So um, a lot of the choreography was kind of born out of um, the, these kind of schema, like disaster schema, care schema, um, and uh, there was like things like the Scott Morrison handshake refusal in Cabago where he refused, where um, locals in Cabago refused to shake his hand after he arrived sort of the day after the fires having um, cut his holiday in Hawaii short. Um, and so it was about around a 20 minute choreography, um, which yeah, continues within this booth and the audience kind of outside. Um, and this leads me to uh, talk about a work called The Eye um, at Brunswick Baths. Uh, this was part of Open House Melbourne, where I selected the bars as another site of my kind of, um, kind of imaging uh, climate disaster, but more broadly thinking about like what, what could new images of the Anthropocene look like. Um, and this kind of ecology that we're in between human and non-humans and this kind of um, evolving scenario um, that is taking place as we speak kind of globally. Uh, so I kind of saw this site as a bit like an inversion of the lifeboat, you know, with the swimming pool, uh, that the, the bodies in the audience were around the sides of the pool or the, and that the, the boat was like, um, in the middle, it, the whole space kind of, to me, I was kind of picturing it like a sort of a speedboat or this idea of an exit. Um, but again, thinking about, well, uh, water and what belongs there, like there was a sort of a crocodile scene here. You can see the dancer Lillian Steiner um, navigating the pool. Um, there was a um, dialogue as well um, that, carried out um, with a lot of experiences um, that people had about, around water, um, including being underwater, being in the womb, um, swallowing water, being kind of drenched or being in a flood-like situation. Um, and I mean, I'll just play a little bit of dialogue today. It's our sanctuary. It's our sanctuary. They know where to find it. It's in the ocean. It's out of my control. Foiling is the highest evolution. It's the apex. Until we have some new thing, but we don't know what it is yet. We're on the outside but there is no outside. It's like an inversion of a boat. Um. Louis, stay where you are and don't touch the mast. Louis, stay where you are and don't touch the mast. 
So yeah, um, this so it was part of the kind of a series of performances. Sand has disappeared from North Moralbra on the lands of the, the ecology assemblage um, and uh, yeah, bringing to life or just kind of imaging um, this idea of um, disaster, but at the same time. Uh, I use this kind of concept from Rosie Bray Dotty called affirmative critique, where um, I try to uh, not do a kind of like burn down the house version, but more a kind of like also finding joy and community um, where I work with um, a lot of different people in the community, but also LGBT communities and uh, just try and build in um, some kind of affirmation within this scenario um, and that's a kind of strategy uh, in the work as well. Um, it's our sanctuary. These are just sort of other stills from the environment. It's our sanctuary. So eventually there were uh, 12 local swimmers that um, also entered the pool uh, fully dressed. So then they were interspersed, interspersed with the audience as well. Um, and, you know, um, I had someone in the audience say to me at one point afterwards that they felt like everybody might end up in that pool. Um, I think a lot of rain. rain. So uh, this is uh, Rich and World, Poor and World, which um, was largely born out of a lecture by Claire Colebrook, actually, um, where she kind of addressed this idea of um, the escape and redressing um, Dipesh Chakrabarti quote of like, will there be life quotes for the rich? And um, just thinking about what escape might look like. Um, and there were, there were, um, sort of references to um, NASA and like the idea of space being one form of escape um, and this kind of disaster where everybody was in this enclosed space and yeah often in my work everybody becomes part of the situation or like sort of audience in the corner. Um, I also work with uh, different layers of people in the work so uh, a mixture of trained and untrained. I think there were six trained and seven untrained performers in this work. I've got a little bit of video that you can watch. <laughs>
sorry, just moving on. <laughs> Uh, so that work came, I just wanted to like go back a little bit as well and talk about like the last sort of decade of uh, working quite large on a quite large scale uh, with live bodies. Um, originally studied sculpture, so always thinking about embodiment and space, but um, have taken quite a lot of time um, with these sort of like, yeah, choreographies within the museum. Um, and all different scenarios. So this was a work called Free Time, which was about um, the, the post-fortis labor and the idea of um, there not being a sort of beginning, middle or end um, to um, certain like work practices and uh, like just also thinking about the idea of um, liveness or theater um, and the idea of like opening or beginning, middle and end of that and disrupting those sorts of um, linear structures um, in the gallery. Um, this work uh, was also performed at Palais de Tokyo as well. Um, and there were people that arrived um, directly after um, a run or a sort of exercise, um, sort of yoga teachers, um, air cabin crew and so on. Uh, this was another uh, work called um, World is Home Planet, uh, which was um, performed inside a theater, Volkshaus Basel, where uh, I navigated the space in darkness with a, a torch and the audience sort of followed me around and I would activate these sort of sculptures and um, bits of choreography um, in this, um, yeah, in a parkour. So everybody um, sort of followed where the light was going and um, there were oranges that were dispersed as the opening scene where you, and they were sort of eaten in silence in this darkness and their oranges were left all over the floor. Um, and yeah, this work then got translated into an exhibition, which I'll show you a little bit later too. Uh, this was Defend Defending Plural Experiences at ACCA. Uh, and that title is kind of born out of Paolo Viano and the, the multitude and the idea of the one and the many, uh, which is kind of still very kind of current idea in my work as well. This was a work um, where I, so I purchased the bags of the performers um, and that stayed in the space. And it was quite nice that um, when people came to look at other works, they would also drop their bags there and sit down. <laughs> um, and the title in exchange for Marx's coat was like this reference to Marx and his family had to trade in their jackets every winter for money or if some are like, I don't know, back and forth between these pawn shops. Um, so I had this like negotiation with the performers um, yeah, to purchase their bags. Um, Twins and Lovers, uh, which was this performance about doubling and multiplicity and um, the sort of relationships and these um, performers spoke candidly about relationships in their lives as they moved through this choreography. Um, Atlas of the Living World at the Stalick Museum Amsterdam was um, like a ticketed performance around 45 minutes seated. So some of the, some of the works are in gallery situations um, and others you stay for the whole time. So it really depends on uh, the environment, that, but I sort of worked across like, um, quite different situations. Um, again, Igor Klesinski with the music and there's kind of like this nature documentary that I'd shot on these string curtains um, and these different um, performers. I was sort of thinking of like this, like um, deconstructed um, David Attenborough nature documentary kind of thing where, yeah, I worked with people to, to um, build a dialogue based on people's daily routines and migratory paths and um, rituals and practices and food and pharmaceuticals and things like that to talk about this, to make this kind of collective story. Uh, and this was the work, which was um, a kind of celebration or engagement with John Caldor's or the Caldor Foundation's um, 50 year anniversary, where I worked with um, all of the people that had produced um, the Caldor commissions in the last 50 years. So there were abseilers who had installed Christo and John Claude's um, 
works on a rock face. There was a, this chocolate here that had like made chocolate uh, bean um, like components for Asan Raza's work. Um, there were IT specialists, uh, female security guards from Abramovich. There's Ian Millis there. Um, Bettina Caldor, like there were all sorts of um, family members and um, kind of just the people, this kind of like um, engaging the actual work that was done and architects and um, and then they would sort of repeat different um, choreographies from the, their um, engagements or their, the work that they'd done. Um, there were dancers in there as well. Uh, this is in the Art Gallery of New South Wales forecourt. Uh, just an early work, Lunging Chambon, um, which involved sort of hoisting myself and the curator in these um, positions and then kind of acting out a dialogue. We could respond, I, I kind of set the parameters that we would respond to each other's movements and one of us would leave when we felt it necessary. Uh, but the Chambon is like this apparatus that horses use so that they don't buck the rider kind of thing. So it's all about this kind of re relation between artist and curator. And I tied the knots in front of the audience. So the whole, and then um, I was, I ended up being the first lead. Um, uh, and just thinking about how like performance translates to sculpture as well in my work, this was called Medea, this is at Acker, uh, where I had 80 plants, heirloom mixes that we'd cultivated from diggers, like, and there were like eight kinds of tomatoes, like Russian crims, um, peach dreams, all these kinds of tomatoes, um, eggplants and fennel. And so I worked with a horticulturalist who, like I was planting all these plants sort of upright in this um, reservoir garden and then made these sort of similar harnesses to the Lanjing Shamlan work. And of course, this is this kind of was born and lived and died in the in the gallery as well in this time. So it's sort of the work kind of evolved and um, it's dried out and sort of fell off and some of it grew back, back upwards and so on. Yeah, this kind of suspension embodiment idea is, can be seen in a number of works. Like this, this work's called Revolution Martini Fountain. Um, it was shown at the Auckland Triennial. Um, and, and yeah, there's this sort of inverted Martini Bianco Martini Rosso. I'd spent quite a bit of time in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. Orpheus, um, this work, a lot of these sculptures are in the Chartwell collection, so they've purchased a lot of my works in the over, over time, which is nice. Uh, this is this uh, tray of eggs suspended over this um, implied doorway. Uh, quite a different approach to like what is a body, but uh, this work's called microchemerism. Um, which is this concept uh, that kind of challenges the idea of the, the eye or the whole self um, and that um, you can find other people's, there's been sort of other DNA, other people's DNA found in bodies of those people who have been pregnant or that blood transfusions and different transplants and stuff. Um, and so there's these little pink bits of DNA. Uh, so I had my karyotype image and um, yeah, then I sort of intersperse these other colored um, uh, DNA carrier type within that as a kind of um, like inquiry into this idea. Mars, um, this is sort of like, a photograph. In <laughs> uh, a with a room of sculptures as well. Um, and this show is called The Female Has Undergone Several Manifestations. Um, 
that work in the back's called Portrait of a Lady. Uh, and then this, the sculptures on the floor. Uh, there's 42 pairs of goggles and 42 phone, uh, shells, which refer to the number of phones in the face. For some reason, I don't know where. I, uh. <laughs> Uh, this is another show, um, yeah, showing, showing sculpture and yeah, so often there's like living material as well. Um, it's a video by Clara Leiden, so it's like a two-person show. Uh, and these sort of stairs, so swimming pool stairs and then these like shelves um, just placed on top. Uh, so this show, Outside Before Beyond, um, uh, was a, a solo exhibition with these string curtains and the exhibition had a temporality as well as a like spatial dimension. So this was, the exhibition was 13 minutes, 59 seconds. Uh, and these uh, videos came on and played for, um, I think it was 10 minutes, 50 or something, and then um, a light with a DMX coded light was programmed to shine on different works for different times, um, which, yeah, came out of that earlier performance work that I showed you in the dark with the, with the torch. So this had like a road um, light in the middle of the room, which moved around. So it's this kind of idea of um, translating the, the dynamics of the theater into a white cube environment where you, you sort of have works fed to you in a particular um, order in a particular amount of time that you look at these works. And some of you might have seen the Faces of Capital exhibition that I curated with honors students where the, the show was set up in this manner as well. Um, but instead of DMX coding, we gave tours um, for the audience and we looked at the works and announced them and spent time with them as a group. Um, so again, a bit like how you are now, this idea where you're sort of experiencing rather than looking at your own leisure. So there's sort of objects, images, and video in this particular show. Uh, I'll just quickly show you a video as well. Of... This is the Mama iteration. Breaking through a lot of work, but um, I've come to the end soon. This is, uh, yeah, this atlas is called Atlas of Anti-Taxonomy. So I've been kind of interested in this idea of like unnaming, but also building ecologies and communities um, through uh, rhythms that sort of talk about, uh, I kind of came across this idea of rhythms as opposed, uh, which talk about differences um, as opposed to thinking about like equivalence or sameness. So that's this idea of like coming together and engaging and, and being like related to in many different um, non-human ways. I think the human figures here about three times, like one through an X-ray um, and like maybe one portrait, but otherwise there's all sorts of like ants eyes, which have been imaged in a microscopy lab. And um, this map resembles the surface of a plum and there's all sort of like lichen growth and, and chopped rhubarb and things like that. And then um, there's some sort of texts as well, digital and viral spread, estimated up to 6.4 degrees warmer by the end of this century. Um, and yeah, you can see all these different, there's a placenta, there is a snail, uh, mushroom growth. Um, yeah, so sort of talking a bit, just like one small thing that was written in my PhD that um, mushrooms that have 36,000 sexes, just to give you an idea of like some of the ideas of difference that you might find in some of these ecologies. Um, but also the way they're sort of imaged. So that's a New York Times like desktop that's um, been, um, 
I just end on these sculptures. Some people might have seen it. Spring. Um, the title it was called "How Will We Replicate Life on Earth and on Mars?" So a little bit like the rich and world, poor and world performance. Thinking about the sort of tech companies like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, and um, how they're kind of um, thinking about colonizing Mars and um, how their tech companies sort of um, control life here, but also thinking about, well, how does the human uh, or how do women and all sorts of other people figure into this scenario. Uh, this is an egg yolk actually. And they're just, uh, so this is a uterus in three parts um, in these refrigeration units. And um, this is resin pore, which is sort of like hot. So it's a bit, it's a little bit like a um, something found years after the human kind of thing, or sort of a museum of, yeah, I, I suppose the last few years, um, the works have been a little bit like with or without the human there, like it could be in the future or that kind of thing. Yeah, that's all I put together. <laughs> Um, firstly, thanks, Alicia. Thank you so much for taking us through that expansive, um, you know, expansive range of projects. We've got time for some questions, and I'm wondering if anyone's got a question for Alicia. Yeah, please. Well, thank you. That was so great. I was kind of wondering about your relationship with costuming. Like a lot of the photos that people wear, the logical costumes. Yeah, everybody plays themselves and they all wear their own clothes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, I also say, oh, could you wear what you wore Tuesday? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, um, it's a bit kamikaze, like I don't have a training in dance or, um, but I come in with a number of, like just sort of resources, like um, either statements or concepts or um, videos and stills. And then I work with the dancers on those. And, um, and then we see how that works and how long to, to repeat something and when other people come in or any of that, yeah. So I guess it's just composing like anything else in a way, you know, but you've got the time-based element too. So always thinking about where the audience is and how they experience it and so on. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah and Matthew. Oh, Hannah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> scenarios um it's something that i guess has happened has just happened in the course of my work uh, or the way i work and also living in europe like what's the, the way artists treated there and so on um it's almost like it's become a sort of necessity um for my work and maybe for certain audiences but i guess that's just the layering that's in it, um, but I like to, it's also nice to just leave it. Like, so sometimes it will sort of hover close to it and then other times it will just kind of 
dissipate or something, but I think, yeah, having a foundation allows you to kind of um, have something to build on. And um, hopefully some of these layers are sort of visible or, you know. So critical whether they are visible. Well, I suppose like you know, um, if you are able to talk about your work in addition to looking at it, I suppose yeah, you have to be able to look. At, I mean, looking at or experiencing is the primary way of viewing. And if you have, but I think there are these layers that if you elaborate or discuss them more, they become more apparent. So there should be a way of reading it without knowing certain theories or absolutely you know um yes but it's i suppose um that's just how i land at something yeah <laughs> sure. um, so many very rich um works that are presented in different you know, exhibition environments and contexts and it sometimes just helps you go and repeat your point but are there any not that many actually I only have only a few of those. Yeah. yeah. Are there any uh, projects that have existed across different um, versions or different? Mm. Yeah, so the actually hardly any of them. Like so pre-time the work that was at um Art Gallery of New South Wales and then later at Palais Utopia, the Paris audience, the, the Art Gallery of New South Wales audience, everybody stood around the, the edges and like looked in. And the Paris version, everyone was like completely intermingled and all walking around together. So I thought that was really fascinating. And um, sometimes like the size of the space, like the, the outside before Beyond exhibition in Dusseldorf was like a much bigger space. And then at MAMA, um, so there, like, there was a little bit of time shaved off. So it was 30 and 59 in Dusseldorf and 12, 52 or something in <laughs> Melbourne. So, um, yeah, but you're right about the different scenarios. Like, I feel like to some extent the invitations kind of have a starting point for what the works become and so on. But um, yeah, it is one of those things like with happenings, it's like Alan Kaprov would say, like, you don't repeat a happening, you know what I mean? And some of the earlier works, like Lunging Chambon, it's kind of more of a happening. But more recently, there's sort of choreographies and so on that could be reperformed and uh, so there is more capacity that I could redo them, um, but it, you know, some work, works aren't redoable. <laughs> but yeah, oh, Lisa. Okay. <laughs> there is now, yeah, yeah. There's always like I think with the earlier performances, which often involve my own body, which I kind of exited. Um, they there was kind of like a set of uh precedents for the work occurring <laughs> in a particular way and maybe rules if you like or parameters and uh and then later on it's like there's an actual order in the time and it gets more strict like um yeah yeah okay. Yeah, it's true. Um, I I kind of also value this um, element of the well, I think whether I like it or not, but I've sort of chosen it. There's always this element of the social occurring. So on one hand, it's choreographed and organized, but then there's the social factors that come in. And like, for example, at the bars, um, I we hadn't seen that. Nobody had seen it. You know, I hadn't seen it either because the audience being there in that time and everything unfolding in that way. And we had this, you know, the the patrons were leaving at six and the audience was coming in at seven and then everything had to be packed down. It's sort of, it's like uh, these things are unfolding in real time often for me as well. Um, and so I have to put everything in and then I have to renounce myself and just stand back and let it happen. And it, it is very intense for me. Uh, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right that it does dissolve and kind of dissipate afterwards. Um, but, you know, you just, it's kind of like occasions, right, in life or moments or sort of, yeah, but um, 
this element of the social is very present here. The interpersonal engagement and, and whatever factors, other factors are there, like preordained or organized or that just happened, you know. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Alan. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I'm there in the toddler's pool all these days. <laughs> um, yes, watch this space. Something else might be cooking. <laughs> you have to wait. Yeah, I'm doing like an exhibition in February um, at 1301 SW. May have some pool related things. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm sort of actively really exited that around 2010. Um, I found it too traumatic, honestly. I just didn't, it was enough to put my work out there, but my body as well was just really too much. Um, so I came to the end of that road. Um, <laughs> I was a bit involved in Richard World, handing people things. Sometimes I, I sort of, yeah, a little bit involved. There is one work called Bison, which I would occasionally re-perform. That's about the only one. But yeah, generally it's just just been one thing too many in terms of that, like, I don't know, emotional engagement that yeah, I'm happy to not do. It was just a limit, I think, you know, for me. Yeah, a lot of the works are um, in fact, all of the ones that have music have been um, uh, produced by Igor Klesinski. Uh, he's a really amazing um, sound designer. He's Polish. Um, 